Hi folks, this is Mike, PC31 The Vinyl Policeman, and I've uh, been wanting to do this video for quite a long time now, and um, I actually saw Bruce Springsteen in Munich a, a few weeks ago, so it's triggered me to actually do this ranking video of all of Bruce's studio albums. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited to do this. I've been talking to a few other guys as well, Lloyd, Lloyd Boom and various people about... Um, this particular one so i'm quite keen to do it and compare to their lists as well um randy nelson very various other um folks in the, in the vc but um, there's a few surprises because what i've done is i've gone through obviously with all of us you know there's certain albums we probably neglect a bit because we there's go-to's that we tend to play all the time with various artists so the ones my more neglected ones in the bruce catalog I've made sure I've given everything a really good play. So there's 21 albums in Bruce's studio um, back catalogue. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking about those. But I'm going to rank this from... There's, there's no worst to best for me with Bruce. This is good or very good to masterpiece or pieces. So um, good to masterpiece, let's call it that. I've seen just to, um, before I start, just to declare something of vested interest that Bruce is probably my favourite artist um along with joe strummer but um been a huge fan of bruce since late 70s um kind of got into him a friend of mine had born to run and uh we played it an awful lot in the late 70s and i think i jumped on bruce around about 1978 when darkness came out saw my first bruce gig in 81 on the river tour which is fantastic that was in london um since then i think i've seen him about 15 16 times Saw him quite a lot on the Born in the USA tour. Um, saw a couple of times at Wembley Stadium. One night he opened up, 4th of July, with Independence Day from the river. Um, saw him quite a lot on the, the Rising tour. Um, seen him in several parts of the world. Seen him in Italy. Saw him in Germany the other day, so Munich. Seen him at the Giant Stadium on the Rising tour twice. Um, but yeah, so basically, I know some people have seen Bruce hundreds of times and, you know, I'm envious, fantastic. But I've seen him 15, 16 times, something like that. Um, a good friend of mine, and I was talking about this the other day, he said to me, isn't it strange that two guys from the south coast of England absolutely love Bruce Springsteen? And uh, we started talking about it. And we thought, well, why is that? Because, you know, what do we know about Asbury Park, you know, the Jersey Shore um, and a lot of the subjects which Bruce kind of sings about and writes about. And I think that's the thing with Bruce. He's just so, he touches everything. He kind of, he's the most emotional songwriter and performer I've ever come across. But he's also, for me, the most exciting. Um, I think he's all things. He, he, he can do anything in that respect. And I think uh, that's the way he gets things across to you because although some songs seem very kind of localised, they've got wider messages and I think uh, it translates from an international point of view. So, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen songs that are about Ashbury Park, etc. we can all relate to different things. So he's an absolute master songwriter, of course. Um, so basically, I'm going to try to keep this as short as, short as possible. Don't, don't want a really, really long uh, video. But if you want to jump in just on the rankings from 10 to 1 or from 5 to 1, I'll put the timeline in the comments below. So just in case you want to you want to cut out some of the lower ones. Right, okay, without further ado, um, 21 studio albums. I could make that up quite easily to 21 because I think that one's absolutely fabulous. 18 tracks and the, and the box set as well, the multi one. But um, that's not classed as... Um, Studio album, but it's fabulous. But uh, there's two I'm not going to include, so I'm only going to rank 19 albums. The reason for that is because Only the Strong Survive is effectively a covers album, and so is Seeger Sessions. I'm not going to include that alongside all the ones where Bruce has written the material or the majority of the material. Um, if I were to rank these in this particular video, that would be 21. That would be at the bottom because I just um, fantastically produced by Ron Ananello. Bruce's vocals are superb. It, the, the actual, you know, it's a fantastic thing, but it's just not something that I particularly wanted from Bruce. Um, but he can do what the hell he likes. <laughs> and the Seeger Sessions, where would I rank that? That would be top 10. I think that's magnificent. Played it to death. I saw him on this tour 
I think it's absolutely superb, but that won't be showing either. So we're just going to go from nine, just 19 down to one. And uh, OK, so what is number 19? Number 19 for me, and no doubt, folks, people will disagree with, with, with lots of these. And there are some surprises for me. When I say when I've been playing them, I thought to myself, God, that album should be played a lot, lot more. It's really strong. Other albums which have slipped for me, which I played a lot in the past. So there were surprises for me with my own rankings. So I'm sure there's going to be some in here. I know there will be some in here which people will rank a lot higher or a lot lower. But this is my rankings, and it's you know it's generally what I believe. Number nineteen, High Hopes, and High Hopes came out in 2014. It was his 18th studio album. This went to number one in 11 different countries. Uh, so, you know, it's it's got it's got merit. Produced by Ron Ananello primarily, but three or four tracks were were, were produced by um, Brendan O'Brien. Um, both real favoured producers of, of Bruce. The problem with this one for me and the reason why it ranks so low is because I think this is an album which has got three different parts to it. There's the Bruce written material. There's the reworked Bruce material. And then there's the the covers. And, um, you know, if you look at the covers first, Dream Baby Dream, the final track, Suicide, um, Just Like Firewood, The Saints, and, and High Hopes as well. I don't particularly think any of those songs are, are very strong. The rework numbers, you know, American Skin, 41 Shots, which is an absolutely wonderful, tearjerker, poignant song of Bruce's. Absolutely superb. And when he played it um, on on the reunion tour with the E Street Band, just absolutely superb. But on this, the production on this, I think it just loses all of its sensitivity. Um, just don't like it at all. The other one, which is in a similar vein, is the Coast of, Ghost of Tom Jode, which on the actual acoustic album Tom Jode is fantastic. On this album, I think it loses everything. Don't like it at all. And unfortunately, I think one of the reasons for that, one of the common denominators, is Tom Morello. For me, I don't like Tom Morello's guitar playing or style at all. Um, personally, I don't think he should have got anywhere near the street band. I don't think he fits it whatsoever. But Bruce obviously loves him. He's obviously a very talented guy. Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine, of course. But um, basically what happened was little Stephen was just signed up for um, the TV series uh, Lily Hammer, he got the star and role in that, and Bruce plays a part in the very last episode. And Lily Hammer, if you haven't seen it, folks, it's absolutely fantastic. Little Stephen is just so good at it. Please watch it. But because Little Stephen was contracted to that, a new guitarist came in, and it was Tom Morello. And I just don't think it did. From a live point of view, I didn't particularly like it. And High Hopes, no, I didn't think so. So that's why for me. Um, High Hopes ranks so low at number 19. So number 18 for me is from 1992, his ninth studio album, Human Touch. And uh, 1992, I know, I know the divorce, the breakup album is uh, Tunnel of Love in 87. But this one in 82, this, this was basically written... And recorded, I believe, by about 1919. Then it was shelved. So this is also got kind of, you know, it still feels that it's got quite a lot of the the angst. And 89 for Bruce obviously was the the resting time for let's call it the resting time of the E Street Band. October 89. He got divorced earlier on that year, um, and so you know when this album was effectively finished 1990, it was in amongst all of that. So. No surprise, I don't think it's the greatest album. Um, the, the inside covers, actually, I just wanted to show you that because I think, for me, it kind of, it shows you a Bruce. That's, that's not the Bruce I know and love. I think uh, you can tell at that stage, he's not in a great place. But anyway, he shelves the album till 1992 and he wants to write one more song for it and that song is living proof um living proof which he wrote about his son and um you know it was living proof of that bond you know the, the new baby evan um he's with patty now etc and that triggered that stimulated bruce's writing juices 
and then he comes out with some some really good songs which are on Lucky Town, which we'll move on to later. But um, but just looking at the songs of this one, I mean, Human Touch, yeah, that's a very good song. Soul Driver, okay, 57 channels. So, so, Cross My Heart, Gloria's Eyes with Every Wish. Uh, Roll of the Dice was co-written with Roy Bitten. Roy Bitten actually co-produces this one. Um, real World, Real Man is a, is a real Huey, Huey Lewis and the News track for me. I just don't like that at all. This album for me, too synthy, feel, it still feels like the 80s, a bit soulless, and it's 59 minutes long, which uh just far too long. There's there's too much album fodder on this one. So there's some there's some highlights as, as there are with every Bruce album, but um there's just too many lowlights of this one. So yeah, Human Touch number 18. And when you think at the time of Human Touch, I mean Bruce had written Red Red Headed Woman, which is really great sick, fun track. Uh, the absolutely sublime Secret Garden, um, All the Way Home, which he then gave to Southside Johnny. I know Little Stephen was working with Southside Johnny a lot of the time. So there were some terrific tracks which could have gone on uh, Human Touch, but uh, but didn't. But there we are. But All the Way Home does, does appear a little bit later. Um, so my number 17 from 2009, um, his 16th studio album, is Working on a Dream. And for me, I mean, there's some, yeah, some great songs on this. I mean, um, Outlaw Pete, fantastic. Uh, Working on the Dream, the title track, I think it's a terrific track. He played that at the Super Bowl halftime. Uh, what Love Can Do, great track. Uh, the Wrestler, superb. There's some really good tracks. It tends to be more on um, the poppy side than a lot of Bruce's albums. And I know, think that was Stephen said that as well. But there are some tracks on here like... Um, Queen of the Supermarket, which I think is quite lightweight. Surprise, surprise, quite lightweight. The Last Carnival. I mean, Danny Federici had actually died on the 17th of April 2008. So the year before this. And The Last Carnival was written, dedicated to um, to Danny from Bruce. Um, but yeah, so pop rock album. Um, it's the last one of um, Brendan O'Brien. Brendan O'Brien also produces The Rise in Magic and Devils and, Devils and Dust. But yeah, just too many weak songs on this one for me. But there are some real highlights. Outlaw P is certainly a fantastic live track. But as, as is Working on a Dream. Okay, so number 16 for me. And this is one which I thought was going to figure a lot, lot higher. But uh, it doesn't. Devils and Dust. So from 2005, Bruce's 13th album. Again, a Brendan O'Brien produced album and it is really good production and i saw him on this tour it's the third of the acoustic albums after nebraska and uh tom jones but um just not enough strong songs on it for me um no e street band of course um and most of the instrumentation although steve steve jordan who's now drumming with the stones is on it most of the instrumentation is bruce and brendan on, on this one but um devils and dust title track just fantastic. All the way home, that's the one that came from the Human Touch sessions, appears on this one. Reno's a funny track because I think musically it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but the lyrics in there obviously are quite infamous, not the kind of lyrics you want to sing, sing in front of your mother. Um, but beautiful music. Long Time Coming, great track. Uh, Matamoros Banks. Devils and Dust is probably the highlight track, but Matamoros Banks is pretty close as well. But uh, but then there's, um, for me, some weaker songs. So played this an awful lot of the time. And as I say, I saw this tour. But uh, this comes in at number 16 for me, Devils and Dust. Okay, number 15 is from 1973, Bruce's second album. And I know this is going to be very contentious because um, a lot of people absolutely love this album. I think the problem with it for me is it's just too jazzy and... Um, genre of jazz jazz just is is not for me um highlights and i mean there are only seven tracks on the album but the highlights for me are certainly sandy i mean fourth of july astry park sandy um incident on 57th street i think it's superb rosalita is obviously beyond superb it's magnificent new york serenade good but i just think as i say it's it's a very clever album bruce absolutely loved it when he recorded it i know there was real problems because 
being the second album, um, his his real champions when he was first signed to Columbia were um, the brilliant Clive Davis, who um, later went on to found Arista, and res resurrected the Kinks careers with the, um, the famous six albums they made for them, the Arena Rock albums, but also John Hammond. By the time this was ready, those two guys had both left Columbia and uh, a new regime had taken over and they weren't quite so into what Bruce was doing. So Bruce presented the final tapes for this and they didn't like it at all. They wanted um, to shorten the tracks. They wanted different musicians to, to play the tracks. They didn't think it had been performed very well. But Bruce stuck by his guns and said, no, I love it. That's the way I want it out. The hierarchy there then said, right, okay, we won't promote it. We're not going to push it at all. And they were true to their word because there's even stories where Columbia men go into radio stations and um, start pulling Bruce off the playlist. I mean, a guy from their own record, their own label kind of thing. So didn't get very much promotion at all. Um, and it's such a shame because I say that Clive Davis, John Hammond were such massive devotees of... Um, Bruce, but they disappeared by that stage. But uh, on this, produced by Mike Apple, um, he was Bruce's manager at the time, and obviously big problems leading up after Born to Run and uh, leading up to Dance on the Edge of Town. But uh, for the first time here, you've got um, Danny Federici, Piers, you've got Gary, Gary Tallon on bass, and um, the big man Clarence Clarence. You've got uh, Vinnie Mad Dog Lopez on drums, and David Sanchez, who would reappear later on in the uh on the springsteen albums but um yeah a bit of a mixed bag for me not one of my favorite albums but some uh, there's some undoubted huge huge highlights on it certainly okay um my next one number 14 which again this will <laughs> ruffle a few feathers because a few of my friends absolutely love this album and i think a lot with music depends on when you heard an album for the first time, what was happening in your life and where you were and what you were into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one never hit very hard with me, but I know it did with, I say, with some friends and people I know who absolutely love the album. But number 14, Tunnel of Love. So from 1987, Bruce's eighth album. And um, for me, you know, there's, it's, it's so 80s. The production's not great. Um, there's Lynn drums on it. There's drum machines, synths. Don't think it's Bruce's greatest effort. But in saying that, there's some fabulous tracks on it. Ain't Got You, Tougher Than The Rest, All That Heaven Will Allow, Spare Parts, Cautious Man, Tunnel of Love, Brilliant Scott. I'm talking it up now. Um, one Step Up, but my favourite track on the whole album is Valentine's Day. I think that's uh, the final track on the album. But produced by John Landau and uh, Chuck, Chuck Plotkin, who um, appears a lot in Bruce's story. But um, this was the PR company of Bruce's don't regard this, although there are E Street Band members on it, they don't re regard this as an E Street Band album. So they regard this as a Bruce solo. So from 1984, the last E Street Band albums born in the USA, and the next one will be 2002, The Rising. But number 14, Tunnel of Love. Okay, so number 13, from 1995, Bruce's 11th album, The Ghost of Tom Joad. This has got a lovely, warm production to it. The second of the acoustic albums that Bruce has produced. Not just Bruce on the album, though. I mean, it's a little bit of Danny Federici, a little bit of um, Gary Talent. Um, on drums, Gary Malabar, who's really good. Uh, produced by Chuck Plotkin. Um, as I say, a lovely, warm production. But the songs on this are very, very strong. Very influenced by kind of, you know, Woody Guthrie, by kind of, you know, Steinbeck. Um, but mid-90s or so, you've got the E Street Band creeping back in now, some of, some of the um, some of the players coming back in kind of thing. But it's the quality of the tracks on this. I mean, the Ghost of Chum Joad, the acoustic version, fantastic. Straight Time, maybe my favourite track on the album. I think that is superb. Highway 29, fantastic. Youngstown, superb, great live track. Um, lots and lots of great tracks on this album. I don't think there's a, a bad one, actually. But, um, yeah, as I say, there's, they're all 
really good albums, folks, and Ghost of Tom Joad is no exception. It's a very good album, but because of the quality of, the, of this rankings, it only appears at number 13. So, number 12. Now, number 12 was um, a huge surprise to me, actually, because I thought when I first started this ranking that this was going to be a lot, lot lower. And I could even make an argument for this album to be even higher than 12. And if there wasn't so many fantastic albums to come, it, it, it would be. So, 1992, Bruce's 10th album, Lucky Town. This is so much better than Human Touch. And it's such a shame that it, it kind of got dragged down with Human Touch and it didn't get the airplay. So underrated. No E Street Band with this one, but... Um, and the production is not fantastic, but the strength of the songs superb. I mean, let me just run through these these songs. Opens up with Better Days, Lucky Town, Local Hero, and it was Patty who went into that shop. It wasn't Bruce, by the way. If I Should Fall Behind, which um, one of Bruce's most beautiful love songs, and um, right about the time of the reunion tour with the E Street Band they played that at every show and it's fantastic Leap of Faith superb Big Muddy beyond superb magnificent Living Proof that was the trigger for this album that was a song where Bruce wanted to write one more track for Human Touch he wrote Living Proof and then his writing Creative Juices flowed and all these songs came out Book of Dreams Souls of the Departed My Beautiful Reward the big takeout from this today folks Get Lucky Town if you haven't got it already. But if you have got it, pull it out and give it a play because I've certainly neglected this album and it is superb. Produced by Bruce, John and uh, Chuck Plotkin. Um, petitional production by Roy Bitten. Um, recorded by Toby Scott and mixed by the wonderful Bob Clear Mountain. Fantastic. Such a good, good album. Number 12 probably could and should be a bit higher. Okay, folks, number 11, and Bruce wrote 80 songs to get the final cut for this particular album. And um, again, others will rate this a lot higher. I just don't, but obviously, come ignore, there's some great things on it. Born in the USA from 1984, Bruce's seventh album. And uh, just number one, just number one on Saturn, I think, just every, everywhere in the universe. Production, John Landau, uh, Chuck Popkin, and Little Steven played a part with this one. Jeff, it's a fantastic album. Of course it is. It sold 30 million copies worldwide. It was the last um, E Street Band album until The Rising in 2002. As I say, 80 songs written for it, and it, it narrowed it down. Bruce narrowed it down to these ones. But um, it's interesting, actually, because going through the 80, Bruce... But they were almost kind of wrapping up and John Landau said to Bruce you still need to write a single and he kind of Bruce said you know I've already written 80 songs you go and write one and then disappeared home for the night and then when Bruce came back in the morning he'd actually written and completed Dancing in the Dark so he really did and does listen to John Landau quite right too uh, but opens up Born in the USA just immense Cover Me Darlington County Darlington County, is, a few of these tracks actually, which I don't particularly like on record. Um, don't know why, they just don't quite resonate with me. But when they're played live, they really do. And Darlington County is a classic one where when I saw the show in Munich the other day, they played Darlington County and the dual guitars between Bruce and Little Stephen were absolutely something to behold. They were superb. Uh, working on the highway, down downbound train, I'm on fire, fantastic. He opened up in Munich with No Surrender, superb. Bobby Jean, I'm Going Down, Glory Days, Dancing in the Dark, um, My Hometown. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a fantastic album. There's no question about that. But for me, it's number 11 because there's just so many fantastic things still to come. So we now enter number 10, the, the top 10 in my rankings. And uh, number 10 for me is from 2007, his 15th studio album, Magic. I think this is a really good album. Opens up with Radio Nowhere, just one of my favourite Bruce tracks. And the penultimate song, Long Walk Home, fantastic. Devil's Arcade, um, Gypsy Biker, Living in the Future, 
you'll be coming to such great tracks on this album. This is a much more, um, where I was working on a dream was kind of pop rock. This to me feels a lot heavier. There's a lot more distorted guitars, high energy rock with this album. Superb production from um, Brendan O'Brien. Really, really, really good. Um, superb. Terry songs on this one, obviously, which um, isn't named at the end, but it was an extra song. Um, Bruce's good buddy that passed away and he dedicated it to him, Terry songs. Uh, there's a nice week of songs in it. Girls in the Summer Clothes, I don't think it's a particularly strong track. Um, yeah, but the rest are pretty strong, actually. Great album. That's why it's number 10 in my chart. Okay, number nine. And... Um, an album from 2019, Bruce's 19th album. Number nine, Western Stars. Um, a beautiful colour vinyl, actually. Lovely stuff. Now, this is an album which, when I've seen um, some other rankings, this one's kind of not gone down too well. I, I just think this is an absolutely beautiful album sweeping cinematic i mean it's an expansive sort of al an album you can with the music that bruce has created it's such a pictorial one you can visualize so many things with it um beautiful album that produced by ron An ananello and, and um bruce superb hitchhiking great track the wayfarer good track toos and train good track Western Stars, sublime track. Going on it goes through. Um, Stones, a classic Bruce track. Absolutely. If, if you think, you know, Secret Garden, those those kind of tracks. Um, Stones, absolutely superb. Moonlight, Motel, beautiful song. This is such a good album. It's only one week track for me, and that's Hello Sunshine, which is the, the Harry Nielsen type thing which i don't think that that works at all but all the other tracks on this i think it's just recorded so well it's a beautiful beautiful album lots of musicians on it david sanchez appears again on a couple of tracks actually um but i know they were trying to channel kind of the jimmy webb type thing glenn campbell and but you know no need to it's bruce springsteen it's just superb if you haven't heard this album or haven't played it very much, just, you know, Western Stars, Stones, Moonlight Motel, to play those tracks, they are magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Number nine is easy in the top ten for me. It's just such quality, such class. Beautiful album, really beautiful. Okay, number eight, we're getting to the, um, we're into the masterpieces now, guys. Number eight from 1982, Bruce's sixth album is... The Haunting Nebraska, the first of the acoustic albums. Bruce had just come off about 140 gigs in 11 months uh, promoting the river. And um, he rented a, a, a ranch, um, Colt's Neck, and uh, near the Jersey Shore. And he started banging off all of these tracks on a small TIAC Tascam four-track recorder. And then he ultimately put them on a cassette. And it was to do demos for the band. Then the East Street Band recorded a lot of these tracks and many others as well which was known as electric nebraska that actual that actual entity hasn't surfaced yet so hopefully it will one day we've had some things from it but electric nebraska itself we hasn't actually appeared yet bruce originally wanted a two album affair for this one he wanted an acoustic and an electric but um Interesting thing is, is with this one as well is that bruce had the cassette tape with the, with the demos as he saw them in his back pocket for weeks and they were eventually given to um, Ch Chuck Plopkin again. And Chuck tidied them up. He mastered them beautifully. And this is this is the result, which is, you know, quite quite incredible. But real sombre, kind of blue-collar lyrics. You know, criminals, dark lyrics. Nebraska, the title track. Fantastic. Atlantic City, superb. And when he plays it with the E Street Band, even better, I think. Mansion on the Hill, great. Johnny 99, he played that in Munich the other day. Highway Patrolman, lots of people have covered that. Superb. State Trooper, used cars, open all night, my father's house, reason to believe. Excellent. What a wonderful, wonderful atmospheric 
album that only Bruce can do, in my opinion. But that's my number eight, Nebraska. Okay, number seven in my rankings from 1973, the debut, the wonderful debut from Bruce. Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, produced by uh, Mike Capel, the manager, also the producer, and uh, Jim Kritikos. Nine really strong songs on this album. Um, Blinded by the Light, Growing Up, Mary Queen of Arkansas, Does This Bus Stop at 82nd Street, Lost in the Flood, The Angel for You, Spirit in the Night, Hard to Be a Saint in the City. Such a really, really strong song. Um, I think Mike Apple preferred the solo, the, the demos of this, but Bruce wanted the full band versions. And this was another classic case where when the album was cut, Clive Davis at the time, who as I say was a big champion for Bruce, he sent Bruce home and said, we need a couple more singles. We need some real singles for this. We need some stronger tracks. And Bruce went home and wrote Blinded by the Light and Spirit in the Night. So those were the two, Blinded by the Light and Spirit in the Night. So those were the two singles which came out to support this album. But um, lots of um, E Street banders in this one. You've got Gary Talent, the big man Clarence Clemens. Um, David Sanchez appears in this one and, and uh, Mad Dog Vinny Lopez. So, yeah, two, sorry, two East Streeters, Gary Talent and um, Clarence Clemens. But absolutely wonderful debut. Really, really superb. And uh, things like Growing Up over the years have been in, obviously, loads and loads of the set, Spirit in the Night, Lost in the Flood, Blinded by the Light. Yeah, fantastic. So that's my number seven. Greetings from Asbury Park. OK, so number six in my rankings from 2012, Bruce's 17th album, The Wrecking Ball. I love the graphics on this album. The artwork, I think it's just superb. Such such great imagery. Um, Clarence had passed away a year before with this one. And um, so there's the, there's a few things which he appears on. The key one there is Land of Hope and Dreams, where um, Ron and Anello, Bruce wanted to bring Clarence in to um, rework Land of Hope and Dreams. And Clarence was due to do that, but... Um, Clarence was feeling some pains in his hand and arms, I believe, which led to the stroke. So it never happened. And then I think while Bruce was touring, Ron Anello played with some of the some of the um, recordings which Clarence had already done, and he pieced it together. So Land of Hope and Dreams was put together posthumously, the, the sax parts after Clarence had passed. But uh, what a wonderful album. We take care of our own, easy money, shackled and drawn, jack of all trades along the lines of Secret Garden, stunning Bruce Springsteen track. Death to My Hometown, This Depression, Wrecking Ball, wonderful live track. Played that in Munich the other day. You've got it. Rocky Ground, I mean, Rocky Ground is one of those which I don't particularly like it when Bruce brings in featured artists and even tries different genres. I just want to straight down the line. But on Rocky Ground, where he tries a bit of hip hop and various things, I think the song is so strong, it works regardless of all these other things going on so i think it's a really good track land of hope and dreams with the clarence parts we are alive but um superb production on this really 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 good um yeah wrecking ball fantastic that's my number six my number five and uh number five well we're getting really close now to the masterpieces but um from 2020 bruce's 20th album letter to you again produced by ron ananello um basically recorded live this this album of bruce's home there were a few overdubs a few guitar solos hand claps backing vocals but bruce basically wanted a real live version of this don't know if you've actually seen the documentary the making of it but one of the things there which really jumps out for me, which kind of we all knew anyway, was just how important little Stephen is in the process, where he comes up with great ideas. Bruce really listens to him and you can see the, the love and trust they got between them. Um, yeah, recorded in four days, no demos. They just kind of went for all the songs were written by Bruce. Um, one minute you're here. Poignant, beautiful little opener. Classic Springsteen, Andy Springsteen could write. Tears to your eyes, superb. Letter to you, fantastic burning train. Janie needs a shooter. Some of these tracks were 
go right back to pre greetings from Asbury Park days and um they're kind of you know dedicated and um to the Castile days and all that all that kind of thing and Jane Needs a Shooter is one of those which goes way back Last Man Standing uh, Power of Prayer um House of Thousands Rainmaker fantastic track if I was a priest I think that's superb Ghost Strong for the Auction I see you in my dreams Bruce has been closing his live sets all over the world with I see you in my dreams but uh number five for me yeah the fantastic as I mostly recorded live letter to you absolutely superb album okay so number four getting really close to the masterpieces now from 2002 Bruce's 12th album the wonderful rising and um, obviously most of the tracks on this album were written in response to the horrendous happenings of 9-11. Some tracks were written before, but which still fit with things like um, My City in Ruins, which Bruce actually wrote about Ashbury Park, but obviously j just fitted the, the tone of the album um, just perfectly. 73 minutes long. I, I, I think it, the album's too long because it's not meant to be a double album. And... Um, I do think you know it could have shed about four tracks, but I but I saw Bruce about five times on this tour, a couple of times at the Giant Stadium, and um, this was the first E Street Band album since um, 1984, Born in the USA, and it's another Brendan O'Brien produced album, wonderful production, but um, also there's been a seven year gap since um, Tom Joad until this was this was actually kind of made. But when you go through the track list, I mean, Lonesome Day, superb. Into the Fire, Waiting on a Sunny Day, Nothing Man, Counting on a Miracle, Empty Sky, another really poignant song of um, Bruce's. You're Missing, I think that's one of the absolute highlights of the album. Such a beautiful track. The lyrics are stunning, absolutely stunning. The Rising itself, the title track, fantastic. Um, my City of Ruins. It's such a wonderful album. My wife's favourite Bruce album. Um, but well worthy of a of a number four place. Even if it did shed a few tracks, I mean, it couldn't go up any higher than fourth. So um, in the ranking, it's way, way up there. But it's a wonderful album with some very, very strong material and brilliantly produced. Okay, top three. So my third album from 1980, Bruce's fifth album and his only double album to date, The River, 83 minutes long. Um, several tracks on this, which came from the Darkness Sessions. I mean, the Darkness Sessions, so much was written for them that um, they had to spill into this one as well. But yeah, John, John Lando, St uh, Little Stephen and Bruce produced but uh, such a wonderful record. Live, these tracks work so well. The Ties Up Blind, Sherry Darling, Jackson Cage, Two Hearts, Independence Day. I say I saw him open Wembley Stadium with that on the 4th of July. Um, the River, he played that the other day when I saw him. But things like Cadillac Ranch and I'm a Rocker, just one, and Ramrod, just incredible rock, rock and roll tracks, which work so fantastically live. But then you've got things like Stolen Car, Drive All Night, which is beautiful, tear-jerking tracks. But there was 50 songs written for these sessions and that were pulled forward from the Darkness sessions and 20 made it to uh, this particular mix. But, um, but it was John Lando who suggested a double album from this one. Bruce, I think, wanted the ties at bind, just a single album. I think John Lando, so influential for Bruce. Uh, suggested it was a double album. What a fantastic idea. The River, 1980, my number three. Okay, folks, so one and two. Uh, what, what on earth could they be? Um, it's the two masterpieces in Bruce's back catalogue, which I don't think too many people disagree with, actually. Just a question of which way round they are, and they're so interchangeable, they could be either way round. But for me, and this this does change occasionally kind of thing, but number two for me is his third album from 1975, Born to Run, eight songs, 39 minutes long. And Bruce's brief for this one was he wanted 
basically Roy Orbison singing Bob Dylan and produced by Phil Spector. That was the kind of wall of sound he was uh, looking for with this one. And the producers were obviously himself, Mike, Mike Appel and uh, John Landau. First album that um, Professor Roy Burton and uh, Max appear on. And um, this one led to the bust up with uh, Mike Appel, which I think they all made up at the end, but um, after it had gone to court. But uh, what an absolute masterpiece this album is. It took 14 months to record. Um, opens with Thunder Road, which could well be my favourite Bruce Springsteen song ever. 10th Avenue Freeze Out, Night, Back Streets, Born to Run, She's the One, Meeting Across the River, Jungle Land. From when the solo, Clarence's solo kicks in, for me could be the finest piece of music ever recorded. I think it's that good. Meet, interesting enough, really rare copies of this. I think the first press, um, some versions got out where Meeting Across the River was called The Heist. And the actual writing on the front here was handwritten. I don't think there's many of those around, but they are really, really rare. This is where I show my rare one, which I've shown many times before. My Dutch misprint. I don't think there's many of these around where um, things upside down. But a uh, masterpiece of a, of a record from 1975. The one which really launched Bruce in, as an international international star. Fantastic record. Unlike the next one, which we're going to talk about, where um, Bruce had time and wrote lots and lots of songs for it. This he concentrated on few songs and I'm saying there's only eight songs on the whole album but they played these over and over and over and I say it took 14 months to record but um Born to Run masterpiece number two so my number one in the rankings and it has been my number one Bruce album for a long long time actually um Darkness on the Edge of Town his uh fourth album from 1978 it was it was harder, it was raw. When you think 78, so punk had hit across the world. And it, this was a much harsher, de deliberately so, raw a sound. No no wall of sound. Quite, quite an austere album, which Bruce was aiming for. And um, Bruce had written 70 tracks for this, and he wanted to record them quick. But um, he was trying to get through all these managerial problems that he had. But um, so an awful lot of songs were written for this. And as I say, some went went on to uh, the river in 1980, a few years later. But um, production, yeah, Bruce, John Landau, with assists from, big assist actually, I think, from Little Stephen. But uh, what a what a wonderful album. Mike Appel, Mike Appel, before this, before he'd actually departed, he wanted kind of, uh, a live album to follow up Born to Run, but Bruce was insistent it would be a studio album. And uh, look at the tracks. Badlands, still plays it now. Adam Raised the Cane, Something in the Night, Candy's Room, Racing in the Street, Promised Land, Factory, Streets of Fire, Prove It or Night, Darkness on the Edge of Town, which could well be my favourite from the album. But uh, what a... what not, not a weak song on the album. Absolute rock and roll masterpiece top three album ever for me um that would probably be born to run this and london calling not necessarily in that order but uh wonderful album so that is my number one bruce springsteen album so i hope you enjoyed that ranking folks i know you disagree with lots and lots of it so give us some comments down below and uh speak again